おてどうしてこんなところに The original Romancing Saga 2 is not only a great entry in the Saga series, but it's also just a great JRPG to boot. The title spans generations, literally, as you shape the kingdom of Varanus through choice and action. As a remastered release, Romancing Saga 2 Revenge of the Seven only elevates this experience. Without changing much of the core game loop and mission structure, there is a nostalgic and challenging adventure here that mirrors my previous experience with the title. That said, I don't think it matters what your experience with the series is for this particular entry. I know, I know, in the past it's always been said either you're a Saga fan or you aren't. But I feel this release does satisfy both camps, with modern systems that streamline the often complex Saga mainstays. I hope to explore these points and shed some light on this unique release in my review. And just to let you know, Romancing Saga 2 Revenge of the Seven has the weight of the entire series on its back right now. As Square Enix did with Trials of Mana, this release feels like a, we're going to go all in and see if we can revive this IP. That said, while corners may have been cut on some visuals and sometimes the performance of the game, I think the general systems for this particular saga release are as sound as any in the series. So with that out of the way, let's just jump in. <laughs> Romancing Saga 2 Revenge of the Seven is set in the Empire of Varenis. Gerard, the second prince of the Empire, King Leon, suffers a stroke of bad luck as the kingdom desperately needs him following an attack. However, this story isn't about Gerard, it's about you, the player. Gerard is a vessel in this narrative, with the player as a conductor. It's honestly an ambitious feature that you wouldn't expect a game released in 1993 would even try to tackle, and yet, here it is again in 2024, and it still blows my mind. Gerard's mark on the story may be how every player first experiences this adventure, but how you tackle the events and how you handle running the region for generations to come all need to be considered during these opening moments. Throughout the campaign, you'll uncover flashbacks of the Seven, which serves as the foundation of the story. I managed to clear the game in about 56 hours, which is about the length of original if I remember correctly, but there's still a lot more for me to do or to replay. Given that this time is based on a casual play, depending on how you approach your adventure, your time can be more or less. Romancing Saga to Revenge of the Seven may be all about choice, but also discovery. As a new leader, your first order of business for any new generation is to receive the royal news from your throne. Here you will receive several missions from citizens you need to help. You can upgrade your kingdom here too. The upgrading system relies mainly on funds, but some structures require found materials. As you create new areas, money will be easier to acquire, but upgrading and managing the aspects of the game early on will help your late game with proper resources. Otherwise, you'll be likely finding yourself scrounging for funds and gear. The next box to check for any generation is forming your party. Every time skip results in a party disbanding, but sometimes skips have more than 90 years between them, so yes, it makes sense. There are a handful of characters met throughout the game that serve a purpose to the story and can even be used across generations, but don't get attached to these characters because eventually they'll probably die. When you die, or time skip happens, you're forced to choose a new character, which could even change their job class. Each generation forces you to refine your playstyle and try new things. While building up a new team and learning new formations is exciting, these moments are crucial for the mission at hand because you have to consider that your party dynamics and strategies will also change each generation. The game loop should be any JRPG fan's delight. Repetition rarely becomes problematic because you constantly change your playstyle and form new parties. Over time, you even gain access to additional classes that will always put your strategic capabilities to the test. Surprisingly, the ninja and divine job classes are available here, and they require missions I've never played or seen since their scenarios were exclusive to the Japanese Wii release. The auto equip option saves a lot of time with a few options to refine your party's playstyle, naturally streamlining the start of each generation. Okay, so now that that's all settled, once you leave the castle, you'll have mission indicators showing you the various key areas where you were just told during the briefing. While this should set you off, there's actually more information about the quests provided in the quest menu. It's here you can choose which active quests you're going on and where you are in the series of that particular quest. 
I like this menu, and I actually spent a lot of time in it mowing over where I should go next and if I should approach the situation in this particular way or see if there's a different angle and maybe even wait for another generation to tackle it. However, there's no quick access to this if you're in the game. You have to go to the pause menu and then you navigate to it. I'd really just like a shortcut from the menu and also from the map if possible. Anyway, while these are all missions you are told, they aren't the only way to progress the campaign. Another ambitious feature of this game is the large map of towns and dungeons. The game is enormous, with each town hosting secret areas and secret missions, and it's up to you to find them. Some towns you might stumble upon with no missions in them and probably never see that place again, but that's likely only because a choice you made affected your campaign, so you never needed a reason to actually go to that town. The mission branching points aren't really easy to spot in the later chapters, but the game gives the player a chance to back out of choices if they think they can try for a different result. For example, depending on how you handle some pirate issues will determine if a war breaks out. Some of these scenarios may even make the main campaign easier if you gain new allies, weapons, funds, and possible access to hidden areas that can get you behind enemy lines. You never know what you're going to get in this game and aren't held to any particular route. Your game is your adventure. Maybe you tried to fight the Queen Termite a little too early and she wiped you out. Don't worry, you'll get her on the next generation. Missable quest lines, routes, and even quests take a few generations to wholly even play out. What you get out of this adventure is actually what you put into it and that's found in the exploration and updates to the combat system. You're never felt confused about where to go or who to talk to with the help of mission markers, but it also gives you enough details to make it appear that you did put in some legwork to get the task done. The mission requests also vary in ways that fans of the game will know all too well, but newcomers will be experiencing this for the first time. I should mention that Mr. S can be found hidden throughout the towns and dungeons, and I encourage you to find him. The reason being that the stamps you get actually allow you to see how many chests are left in an area and even increase your funds over time. Chests are essential as they contain powerful gear and sometimes even abilities. I'd say you should always go out of your way to get these items, but enemies often prevent that. Unlike other saga titles, it's actually okay to fight in this game, and the difficulty if you play on normal won't screw you over as a result. This game can be mean though. If the original release didn't leave you confused about how to progress a quest line, then you'll likely be getting your ass kicked in some fight. While this entry is miles easier on normal difficulty than the original, I still think the challenge exists. During the first few generations, you'll likely won't have to edit your party formations or abilities too much. Still, you'll need to understand party dynamics later in the game before heading out each time. Creating a party that excels in magic skills and buffs could work, or going in heavy on defense with speedy attackers is also a viable way to approach fights. However, you can't expect to rush into a fight and just spam attacks thinking you'll make it out alive. You need to exploit enemy weaknesses while managing your party every turn. A character dying in a saga game is probably the worst thing that could happen. When you die, you lose one life point. That character's pool of LP differs, but if it hits zero, that character is gone. Further, battle points need to be managed. These are utilized if you use abilities that require BP. The interesting thing is that BP doesn't replenish after a fight, but HP does. This system actually flips the script on combat dynamics because HP isn't the most crucial thing anymore. It shares the spotlight with BP and LP in this brilliant synergy that this series has only perfected over the years. Further, depending on the abilities and elements used in battle, technique points are distributed to those areas following the fight. If you're trying to build a light element user, using light text will help you do that. During battle, if you exploit enemy weaknesses, a chain attack gauge slowly fills up, allowing you to execute group attacks. I really liked this, but I thought it was a little cheap how it only filled up a set amount based on the player's character that did the attack. What I mean is if I exploited three enemy weaknesses in one group attack, the gauge seemed to fill up even if I just hit one enemy. But once it does fill up, the result is a strategically charged turn-based experience balanced so that the grunt enemy encounters don't overstay their welcome. However, they eventually get a little annoying. But the boss battles will consistently test you and leave you wondering if you should just come back again when you're stronger. Romancing Saga 2 Revenge of the Seven is all about the player's adventure, and I feel like the updated visuals do a great job of presenting this game to a new generation of gamers. It just felt a little insane sometimes to play some of these scenarios that I played in 2D format years ago. The team did an excellent job of giving unique touches to each town instead of making them all look the same. However, draw distance is a huge issue in this game. You can visibly see low-resolution enemies and NPCs coming into focus as you get closer. 
further. There were moments of dropped frames, but nothing actually took me out of the fun that I was having. If you've ever been afraid of Saga as a fan, I'll tell you that they are finally doing right by this series as a modern package. However, then I entered the steppe and savanna areas and clearly understood what this team was actually doing. These areas and others are beyond what I assumed I'd see in this game. Similar to like Final Fantasy X, they are reminiscent of classic JRPGs that feature large areas with branching paths, connecting towns, and explorable dungeons. It was just fun making small discoveries in these sections with no real goal other than exploring. Quests sometimes bring you through here as well, but like I said, exploring an area you don't need to, or a place you haven't been in a while or in a few generations, can often reveal some fun secret scenarios leading to more rewards. So the question is, can this series continue down this path and still be profitable in the future? Well, I think we're finally on the right track. The biggest hurdle is adapting this nuanced and unique combat system in a way that retains its depth, but presents it in a digestible way to a player likely playing more than just Saga. When I first played Saga Frontier, it was the only game that I had for an entire year. I had to play it and understand it to progress, but that's not how gaming is anymore. Today, the moment a player feels challenged, there's a guide waiting for them on YouTube. Romancing Saga 2 Revenge of the Seven removes the need for a guide, but still rewards those players smart enough to think outside the box. It's an excellent first step into what the series can be, and I love this new direction. Romancing Saga 2 Revenge of the Seven is riding the high of the turn-based combat system popularity wave that we're experiencing. This is your adventure told over generations. Your actions or inactions shape the narrative, delivering a JRPG adventure that you can share within your gaming circles, and each player shares a unique story. The beloved combat system retains its depth while providing feedback to the player to make it more accessible, and the quest lines have proper descriptions that keep you grounded in your task and limit confusion. Sadly, performance and optimization aren't the best, but the character models are nice to look at. Time went into this project, and it definitely paid off. This is the best version of Romancing Saga 2 that I've ever played. I can't believe I'm saying that more than 20 years since the first time I played it, and 30 years since it was first released, but here we are. Noisy Pixel is giving Romancing Saga 2 Revenge of the Seven an 8 out of 10. Thanks for watching. This video is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon. Noisy Pixel is run by a group of gamers providing independent gaming coverage through news, reviews, previews, and more. Check out our Patreon to help support our continued growth and subscribe to keep up with all our future content. Noisy pixel.